Hey all, welcome to another session of Regen Civics. Today we're going to be getting more into organization and how we structure our projects. And actually, right before we started the recording of this, Neil asked a question more tangible to his project. He has some work that he needs done. So I'm actually going to pass it to Neil because he's going to set up the, what we're going to be talking about today. So you could start it off with the first question. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Raiky. I mean, I saw the subject agenda today was about creating working groups and teams for practical implementation. I mean, you know, along those lines. So we've been doing a lot of practical implementation lately with like getting a lot of legal agreements done, um, getting a lot of accounting done. So really sort of building a network. And the part where we're getting stuck, which is ironic, is um, web development. <laughs> um, is we're, we've, uh, I've been working with a group over the last 15 years prior to coming to Seeds, where we actually created a co-creation tool, which is where people, would, it looks like a YouTube page where people up, uh, present ideas and people upload the ideas. We've um, registered 10,000 people over six communities to develop these downtowns um, over 10 years. And it's just really brought the community together. And that was developed in 2008 on WordPress. And so here we are, 2022, we're still using the same system. And I would love to actually make this open source and to find other developers that wanna help develop this open source tool for their own use um, and to also update it so that, you know, something built in 2008 is relevant. And then, you know, we tried building something in another programming language, um, like, and the only developers that we had available were Drupal. So obviously not ideal. But we have this working version of WordPress that we'd love to actually open source out and work with a development team to actually have people use it for their own sites. And then over time, improve it, maybe do put it in an entirely new programming language. But we have all the specs, we have instruction videos of like how, how the whole thing works. It's all sitting there, but I personally have had a hard time finding even one person that actually wants to work on this um, with me, with us, and we're going to pilot it with the Lala Gardens project, where every person who becomes an owner of the Lala Gardens project, which is only $100, gets to actually be able to put ideas up on the site and upvote ideas. And so, so the whole structure, the community, everything's in, a lot of ideas are all in place. And what's ironically missing is just people who know how to develop in WordPress. So I wish there was a way, I don't quite know, you know, and then even Reich has suggested ways to like um, where to post this, but like it'd be, I would love to act form a working group. And I did form a, a channel for that, a, a co-creation tools working group in the Region Civics Discord um, in our um, you know season one section. There's a new feature of um, a brand new feature in Discord that just came out just a, publicly a couple of weeks ago, which allows you to in, within a channel create mini channels like subcategories within a channel. And so within this channel of working groups, you can create these sub channels of different working groups. So I created one on legal, I created one on, um, I can't remember what else, another one, uh, oh, uh, NFTs, and then one on co-creation tools. So I would love to see if there's maybe three or four people in this region civics community that would say, yeah, we'd love to help build these co-creation tools that we can all use as open source uh, tools um, and collectively build this together. I can even do a quick screen share. Yeah. Susan? No, I said that was a good job. Thank you. Yeah. I can do a quick screen share so you can see what it looks like. Um, so this is this is the uh, this is a um, this is a Drupal version of it. See how it's very quick and uh, fast, but doesn't always work. Um, and then there, that's the Drupal version. And I got a screenshot again to show you the um, one in. Well, I'm just going to use desktop. Um, and then there's one in Chrome or WordPress. This is it. This is what it looks like. So it's in their spaces, outdoor spaces. Not as fast, but this is this is what we've been using for the last 14 years. And so when you go to idea, it, it has little descriptions of it. You can upvote the ideas like that. Or you have to actually register to be an upvote. 
Um, and then each idea has its own little discussion thread. So it's a way of, um, of seeing what the community wants to see and, and organizing it. Um, so this is already built and we'd love to find a team that wants to, it's, it's $30,000 worth of work. Um, if you, if, if we just had a, someone quote, uh, assess it yesterday and say, yeah, you want to build this, it would cost you 30 grand. So we want to give it away for free, but we want to find people who can help develop it together. Nadine? Yes, thank you so much, Neil. That looks beautiful. And for me, this looks like a quest, a quest coming out of the Lala Gardens that we can publish. And um, in the Seeds community, there are many developers out there, right? And especially on the Hyper Discord server, there are a lot jumping around and they are waiting for some smaller quests or bigger ones, but they need kind of coordination tools. And what the Seeds Commons um, has now um, voted on was um, a co-creation circle for product stewardship or product development, um, where we can coordinate these quests ecosystem-wide. And I love to <coughs> I would love to share with us um, the notion tool here that we have created for the Region Civics Alliance. And Every organization has its own place here, every um, village. And I am uh, supporting right now Finca Sagrada with that, right? So if your quest is overarching for the whole region Civics Alliance, you can post it here to the community. Or if it's only for Finca Sagrada, for example, then you have a collaboration space here where you have quests as well. And here it looks then like this um, typical Kanban board. And then you have different quests here, right? And the community then can see it. And if you have a web developer, then they can pick it and move it into co-creation. And then they can start working on it. And on each card, you can then start collaborating here. And then I can put your name here, Neil, as a collaborator or as a focalizer, and we can start collaborating together. All this is, um, as well facilitated by the Seeds Commons. The Seeds Commons is trying to have a, a bigger um, quest backlog and the whole ecosystem to support each other. And um, you can find it as well in the Seeds calendar. There is um, a Seeds product stewardship circle here where you can jump in, or we have a Seeds notion circle where you can jump in anytime. Um, if you have questions regarding that collaboration. Everyone here in the um, Region Civics Alliance has access to the Region Civics Notion place, right? And when you use this place, please just go here to the top and make it as your star. When you have it as a star, then it appears here in your favorites, and then you can have the bar here. So. My recommendation is keep as less information here as possible, only very important ones, and then start collaborating. Here we can have exploration groups um, and then have important information here, not a big chat. This is only about moving quests around and collaborating, right? And then when you have it in cooperation, you have it done, then you go into review and then you can celebrate. Right, so I'm gonna share the link here again for everyone in the chat. And if you have any questions, you can come to me anytime. Thank you. Awesome, Nadim, I was actually gonna call on you <laughs> to share more on the, worked out perfect. Um, Neil, thank you for sharing that because this is kind of meta, we're talking about one, where do we go to place roles and like how do we when people show up to the movement right now they say hey we want to collaborate on something what do we actually do so what nadim just shared was we have this notion board where it can filter people in they can find the project that aligns with them and see what work needs to be done there or find what one of the alliance partners are bringing right so this is what we're going to be getting into today is actually designing our roles and designing our quests for the stuff that our projects need right now and in the very near future to succeed. So that's why I want all of us to start doing and I can share in the chat a couple of links and I'll do that in a second. Um, actually, before I keep moving forward, Anders, you have your hand up. I'll pass it over to you. Hey, hey, uh, good to see you guys. Uh 
one uh, one suggestion for that notion board, I think that as other people are going, when other people start to open up to want to explore what it is that we're all doing, I think that it would be helpful for them if we had an organized, what some type of organized sense of, of major categories in those notion boards, so that people can kind of go in and kind of feel um, feel more comfortable, so that ever so that the menu of the exp explorations aren't totally different across the board. It's just a suggestion for us to um, explore. Um, and then the other thing is um, I look forward to talking to you more, Neil, about your, um, you know, about your systems and all that. I used to be in tech. I spent most of my most of my entrepreneurial life in tech before I started land development. And I know a lot about Drupal and WordPress and all of that stuff. And so I have a lot of things to say about it. Um, one of the major things and one of the hardest things is that it's really, really hard when we invest so much money into a platform that is quickly being uh, in one way or another um, obsolete based on new Web3 technology. And so through our, I think what is really, really beautiful and what is really, really powerful, all the systems that we're setting up and all the thought that went into how your system works is, is where I think that the, the huge amount of value is. And I think that rebuilding something like that in new web3 technologies could probably be better for all of us you know like like long term so yeah i just look forward to exploring how we can somehow some way collaborate and you know support you in a way that is going to be fruitful for all of us and not working on a technology stack that is not necessarily the fastest or best for what we need to do to move forward yeah just quick comment i'm 100 percent agreement on it I've just heard people say, if you want to build it from scratch with a new thing, even if with all the specs, it'll still cost you 20 grand and take you three months. So, you know, um, that's ideal. If you can find a way to do it in less time and less money, that would be great. In the meantime, the only thing I have viable is to just fix what's half working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just that, yeah. just good enough, right? But like, yeah, what you're saying is what I would be ideal. Yeah, let's talk more. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, and putting into context then, at least for me, is Neil, the tool you just shared would be really great for any project to help identify the priorities for that project. So this is when communities are coming together and there's a million things that community can work on. This is so that anyone in the community can come up and put up an idea and say, hey, let's you know improve the park or let's build out a new educational system or whatever it is. And then people get to upvote that and discuss it, et cetera, and then you find your priorities. So this is also really helpful for budgeting. So if we're doing this within each season, then the season that comes up and you have a budget, then you look at your priorities and you say, okay, for this next season, we're gonna work on these three priorities. So this is a way of just crowdsourcing what you're working on as a community. Um, Neil, actually, I'll pass it to you because it looks like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I sorry, just a quick note. I mean, that tool leveraged was a primary reason that some, a group outside group invested 17 million into this whole crowdsource placemaking initiative to revitalize downtown. So um, it, we know it works. We just, it's just been a while since we have moved away from these types of projects to something more regenerative. And for the last five years, I haven't had a regenerative project to do this with. And so Lawland Gardens is the first. And anybody here after? So then I'm going to echo what Anders said that, Neil, I think definitely the way to go with this in the medium term, maybe not immediately, is to build this into a front end of a DAO itself so that the upvoting is done by the members so that you know that the actual votes are legitimate, you know, and you can also get, you know, specialized with the voting and give more voice to people who are more part of the community, et cetera. Um, so we can start getting specialized there, but then also when you're distributing money, you are doing it based on the community's crowdsource preferences. So instead of like we use this tool and we say these are the priorities, but then when it comes to budgeting, they just fund something else random anyway. This way we can ensure that the community priorities are what gets funded because we can codify that into the blockchain, right? Um, so I think building this tool into a DAO is probably the better way to go, um, yeah, for that medium long term. So I think that might be really interesting talking to maybe Haifa or the other DAO groups out there and saying, hey, can we build this tool into your front end and then getting them to you know, fund it and make this a priority? Because this is huge and DAOs are looking for right now, a beautiful front end that's really thoughtfully designed and that has been used uh, to help crowdsource what's important for that DAO and community to work on, right? So this is a huge problem in the space and this is a solution for you know, any group. 
Um, so that might be a way to go. And I can bring that into what I'm putting together right now. So let me share with you guys this, which is at the end of this first video I'm making to introduce Regen Civics. Um, I've got a card for each one of the Alliance organizations and, and help share where that organization fits into the whole ecosystem. So, you know, orient people to everything that's going on here, which is huge. So this is saying like, hey, you know, this is local scale. They're helping us build local economies and marketplaces. So who the Alliance organization is, where they fit into the whole ecosystem. And then going one at a time through each um, organization. So actually, Neil, you're down here. We can add this to Regen Living if this is one of the Regen Living offerings, and I can mention it. Um, but any one of the Alliance organizations within the Alliance right now, please reach out to me. Let me know what your offerings are, you know, what gaps you're looking for, and then I'll have it at the end of the video. And then for any of the projects, you can also get me a list of the things that you need um, as an organization right now to help you succeed. So if projects are saying, yeah, we you know, our project needs someone to take over the DAO and launching a DAO for our project, or we need someone to work on our tokenomics or whatever it is. I'm sure you have these gaps in your community. We have people on the other side of that who want to help projects, but they don't know what project they want to be a part of. So you can set up a role and say, hey, you know, if you fill this role for our community, we're going to give you some of our tokens for our project, or maybe we're going to give you room and board and you can actually come live here and help us build out our DAO plan or whatever it is. So make what your offering is and what you need, and then we're gonna call that a role um, or a quest. So that's the two different ways we're kind of categorizing what your community needs. A quest is just do X or A, B, C and get Y. So you can say, hey, you know, show up to a gardening day, help us plant a garden for three hours and you're gonna earn 10 tokens or whatever it is. So that's a quest. And that could be a standing quest that your project or community has. Your quest might be watch three of our videos of our, you know, alliance organization, what we're about, and write an article about it and earn some tokens. So quest is anyone can do this action and earn some tokens. Why our role is we need someone who's going to fill these obligations and these rights and responsibilities, etc. There's a template to what a role actually entails that I just shared in the chat. Um, you can follow that. Um, and then that's the role. And if we all follow this template, it's going to be a lot easier for people to move from one organization to another within our ecosystem, right? So that they understand what a role is, what it entails, and then how they can take that understanding and go join another project, another organization much easier. Um, so if we follow a similar template or the same one rather um, and iterate on that template together, I think that's a better uh, route for us as an alliance. Um, so I said a lot there before I dive into any more of, you know, unpacking roles and actually giving a presentation. Does anyone else have anything they want to share or add to the conversation right now um, before we're going forward? This could also be on anything because we didn't actually open this session up, we just kind of dive right in. Um, so does anyone have any announcements or anything they wanted to bring at the start of today's session? Well, I did share in the Discord and in other meetings that we are developing this template for green contributions that we feel is very aligned and wide to, to keep evolving, but for sure it would help as a base for, for making these uh, fair distributions of resources. You can give the link in the chat. Awesome. Epic, Felipe. Um, let me share with you my screen then. So I shared with you all this. I put up right here. I have my hand up. Oh, yes. Go for it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. Uh, Nadim has agreed to go to Pinka Sagrada and support Pinka Sagrada as it onboards uh, DAO. Uh, using the Haifa tool set. And he's going to go down uh, there, I think, sometime this month and work with Susan and Walter to do it. And he's also helping upgrade the um, Finca Sagrada Vilcabamba app that we developed for when people go there, they have this resource they can put right on their phone. And he's upgrading that and updating it and working with us on that. And that was originally created 
uh, for last year by uh, uh, Joaquin when we were sitting our first group down there to think of Sagrada. So I just wanted to make that announcement. Awesome. Yes, and that app, um, when, when the app is up to date, um, we can white label it and give it to the other communities here in the Regional Civics Alliance. It's a pretty nice and easy to use app to onboard your members when they come into your village and um, they get the necessary information. You can start, start with service there and other stuff. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's like having a really cool local app. So whenever volunteers, visitors, anybody comes to your particular eco village, they have a, an immediate resource on their phone and it tells them, you know, where the cleaners is, where, where you get this, where you get that, where the addresses are, the bios of people they're going to be meeting and that it's all in that little app. So I imagine what's going to come out of this is a debrief, Nadeem, on how you help them set up their DAO and what tools you use and that sort of thing. Maybe. Well, we, thank you. We, we start we start with the with the notion space right now to have um, a high level. Um, project management, right? So you can go here to Finca Sagrada and you can see it there. If you go to roadmap, you can see um, the steps with the milestones that we are planning. And this is just a high level. It's not very in detail. And the first thing we will be going with Hyper together over the OS canvas it's in, in developing the operating system for the DAO then, right? And then, yeah, you're welcome to to jump around here and take a look how Finca Sagrada is doing it and just copy paste it, right? Just copy paste. Nadine, what you're building is incredible. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend organizations that are looking how to organize themselves to you know copy and paste and skip a few months of effort. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Nadine. Um, any questions for Nadine? Before I, we... I could just yep, I could just help. throw in as um, this for for us at Finca Sagrada. This is fantastic because uh, you know I was scratching my head. How are we going to move forward? And then. It's all going to fall in place. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Sometimes I feel like we're doing this for the next generation. Um, <laughs> so it's exciting. Uh, we still are doing this for the next generation. We'll probably be the one after them that most appreciate all the work we put in today. But, you know, we'll get to enjoy some of it. Uh, <laughs> So let me take us back up now, shift gears to dive into the, the basics of what we're organizing with our projects right now. So we talk about an organization system, it's kind of like the big why, like what are we actually trying to organize to accomplish here? Um, and in short form, I'm saying we're organizing to try to accomplish our needs. And some you know, some wholeness of your needs. So not every project is going to try to meet everyone's needs. They're all of their needs. You might meet just their need for housing or just their need for love or community or whatever it is. Um, so you as a project are going to first identify, actually, let me take us back a few steps. Because I have a nice graphic for all of these things. All right, so every project is going to... Very good. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. We've been having some fun putting this all together and trying to condense what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so these are all different organization forms. I'm not going to go over the whole presentation here. I'm just going to give you guys an idea. And you see each organization form it has its you know boundaries of what needs it's actually trying to meet. You know, so for example, businesses, they're pretty clear today. They're not here to meet your needs for love, you know, keep your problems at home. If you have emotional problems or whatever it is, they don't belong in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. They're really clear on saying our boundaries are to meet a certain subset of your needs and probably not even do that really well, you know, depending on the business. 
you know, some businesses are really okay with depriving you of your needs. You know, Amazon has warehouse workers that, you know, they're having urinary issues because they can't take enough bathroom breaks. You know, that's clearly, you know, depriving people of their needs being met. So like, where do you land on this? So like, what needs are you actually trying to meet as an organization? It's gonna be different for all of us. Then of course we have different organization structures that have attempted to, or that at least define saying that they're gonna meet our needs more fully. Um, so where your project fits on this, it's gonna be unique. So you get to first identify, you know, what level of needs are we trying to meet for the participants of our project, right? Um, so that's one side here. Again, this is a super brief overview of this presentation, but I'm almost done with the full thing. So let's bring us back to here. And maybe I'm glad I did this because maybe that slide's supposed to come before this one anyway. And then we touched on this a little bit last week, but then as after we've identified what needs we're trying to meet, then we're going to build structures for going about meeting those needs. So this is just, again, first principles. How do we meet our needs? How do we organize ourselves to go about meeting our needs? So, you know, we have a need for water. Good. So we're going to set up a water circle. And then this circle is going to be able to go about figuring out what's the best way to meet our need for water. Is that to bottle up water and poison streams and then sell us back water at a profit? Or is it to make our rivers drinkable again? You know, it's up to each project to define this, right? But that's the cool part is then we go through and we say, okay, we're going to try to meet our need for water. We're going to try to meet our need for habitat. We're going to try to meet our need for food. Uh, we're going to try to meet our need for, you know, festivals and rites, you know, helping us evolve through this journey we call life and really enjoy it. You know, that's a huge need of ours. That's a, also deserves its own presentation just unpacking this circle, but moving forward, um, we're going to need to meet our need for nourishing air. Like, let's actually fill <laughs> our air with beautiful pollens and scents and smells that are going to really nourish us as we breathe. You know, how do we meet our need for trust and communication, actually organizing our dues and structures? You know, then how do we meet our need for love, etc. So anyway, we're going to actually set this up with our organizations, identify what structures for what needs we're trying to meet. So in your organization now, I'd say set one up and say, well, we have a need for structuring ourselves, you know, and creating trust within the members that are about to join our community. So you might start, uh, clicking doesn't work here, you might start with a trust and communication circle and say we need a circle that's going to communicate with new members, help them understand what's going on here and build trust. So this is what deals with setting up a do and setting up an economy because those are all fundamentally about meeting our need for trust trusting each other and coordinating together. Um, then you might move on and say, yeah, we're going to meet people's needs for structure and habitat as well. So then you set up that circle. We're going to meet people's needs for food. Great. We're going to set up that circle. And then after you've set up the circles, that's Earth's needs. Of course, we need to meet those too. Um, yeah, bouncing in the wrong order here. All right, there we go. Found the slide I'm looking for. Um, after you've set up the structures and we know what circles are going to make up our organization, then we're going to go set up the roles and the quests that belong in each one of those circles. Oops, take it back here. And one example of that is using this regenerative ikigai idea for roles. It's that every role is designed from the perspective that it's going to meet somebody's regenerative ikigai. So, for example, you might not make a role that's about someone going out there and cleaning up garbage or shit or whatever, because maybe that's probably, you know, the chances of that particular role being someone's regenerative ikigai is very low, right? So, if we're coming from the lens that we're only designing roles that are going to fulfill someone's life purpose, then it's a different way of thinking about designing a role rather than, you know, fulfilling a particular objective need. We're finding something that's going to, you know, subjectively fulfill someone's life purpose as well. What does this actually mean? It means when we go through and say, okay, living water, does that mean we're going to design roles that are going up and collecting up bottled water? Because is that someone's icky guy? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Does that mean we're setting up roles for people to bring rivers back to life and you know, help make springs drinkable again? Absolutely. And I know several people who feel like that's their entire life purpose is to restore rivers and that they've talked to rivers and they said that that's their life purpose. And they're very committed to, like, you know, making rivers drinkable again. So, OK, yeah, maybe it is someone's guy to make rivers drinkable again. 
you know, so that's something that we consider as a role. So first step again is setting up what you're actually going to try to meet the needs of and setting those up as structures and circles within your economy. Then you're going to set up roles about how the existing people here are going to you're going to set up roles for how that circle is going to go about meeting its needs. <laughs> there you go. So in the living water circle, you might have a role for going up and establishing springs again, making rivers drinkable, etc. In the food circle, you might have a permaculturist and their role is to go around and plant food forests and just make the place abundant. You know, for the trusting comms, their role is to set up <clears throat> the spaces for dialogue to happen, understand community problems, work through those problems, evolve through tension, etc. You know, for love, their literal role is for helping people find and cultivate love in all the dimensions that exists. Um, that's a very, very critical and important circle. So all the roles that exist within that circle are gonna, um, anyway, I'm digressing. So I'm gonna pause here in case there's any questions because <laughs> I said a lot. So first step structures, again, what are we trying to accomplish? What needs are we trying to meet? Let's build a circle for each one of those. Then let's design the roles that are gonna exist within that circle based off of the values that we have. One of those frameworks could be this Ikigai framework. It could be whatever. Maybe you use human design and you think, you know, that's a really powerful framework. And then you build all roles based on the human design framework. Like, I don't know, that's up to each project to kind of identify this. I'm not saying that these are the structures you use and don't, you know, I literally put these circles together, just making this slideshow. This isn't something I've spent like years, you know, sitting and thinking this is the best, you know, structure for an organization. So I'm not preaching that either. I'm saying this is just the process and step to go through to design our economies, right? Um, okay, so pausing there, any questions, thoughts, feedback, anything before we keep going? Um, no? <clears throat> okay. Um, then just more from a philosophical point of view, this might be helpful as, again, we're thinking through designing these new economies here. Um, I've identified four different types of economies. Just there's a lot of different types of economies. I'm not saying it's limited to these. There's just four different things that are familiar to help ground us. Um, one of them being monopolies. So you're going to decide also how these circles are going to be economically governed. Sometimes a circle needs to have monopoly power. Monopoly is that that circle can enforce actions on other members of the community. So for example, if you have a circle that's you know, responsible for membership, that circle has a monopoly on membership power, which is really powerful. And some communities are gonna have that. So also none of these are necessarily good or bad. You know, they're just different forms. You know, monopolies work really well when those who are in that monopoly power are all knowing and benevolently acting, you know, because then it's really easy. Yeah, for sure. If we can have a king that was the most benevolent and all knowing and omnipotent king, that might be a really good economic structure, you know, <laughs> but hey. Anyway, so then the next one is free markets. A lot of our world is really familiar with that. And it's just saying, you know, align incentives and let incentives kind of coordinate behaviors. So this is really popular in Web3 too. Um, the other one is roles. And this is what we're um, I'm unpacking here a lot more. So I'm saying when you design each one of these functions, you could design it from a free market perspective. So instead of setting up Ikigai roles like I'm talking about, you can just set up incentives for certain behaviors to happen. So you can imagine that, you know, if Bitcoin was going through this, they might say, hey, we have an incentive to you know, direct $10 billion a year towards electricity companies. You know, we want to design an economy that's doing that because we really care about the well-being and interests of electricity companies. So we're going to set up this game theoretic environment that's going to use free market forces to achieve an outcome of using electricity. So if they approached it from that direction, then awesome. <laughs> that's, they did a really powerful, incredible thing. They used free market forces to consume a lot of electricity, right? So maybe we can use that same logic to do other things, you know, so a circle can approach it from, you know, a free market perspective as well. And I think there's a, there's a lot that can be opened up there, but anyway, um, or the sovereigns idea and sovereigns is just the other end of the extreme where we're not coordinating at all. You know, a sovereign is when you take care of your own needs, you know, your family's needs and you're sovereign. You're not, your needs aren't 
dependent on any other external environment or situation. When today, when we're using roles and markets and monopolies, et cetera, our needs are always dependent on those systems, you know, working and working well. Um, so that's always put sovereigns up because it's like the foundation <laughs> that any other economy, you know, is predicated of having to do better than. Because the whole story that we've been told in life is that, you know, life is really hard when we're on our own. So we only came together as tribes and groups of people because it was easier to meet our needs that way. So that's, you know, the whole story is predicated on that belief. So it's our job to make sure that is true. If ever any one of these systems make it harder to meet our needs than it is being sovereign, then that system probably failed. You know, if a nation state is making it harder for some people to meet their needs today, then if they were just, you know, in a jungle on their own free, then maybe that nation state has failed. It's, you know, fundamental duty of helping people meet their needs easier, right? Um, that's a huge concept, but I'm saying it always has to be here because sovereign can be the foundation that all the other economies have to say we're better than that. We're helping people meet their needs better than if they were on their own, right? Um, and this is kind of what the homesteading movement is about. It's about being coming sovereign as a family. And there was, you know, purportedly entire civilizations that were predicated on this notion as well, where every family's needs were met within their domain. So when they came together to coordinate on any scale larger than a family, so when, you know, larger bands started to come together, their coordination, you know, and the outcomes of those coordination wasn't affecting their needs being met. So their needs are being met regardless of the outcomes of any political debate or any change of blockchain algorithm code or any of that stuff, right? And then I think that's a powerful concept because if we're coming together and we're coordinating where our needs are being met, we get rid of a lot of the conflict potential that comes when we try to scale our coordination. When people feel like they could be, you know, dramatically harmed and their well-being can be dramatically affected by the outcome of a vote, for example. So today in nation states where people are living on welfare and a monopoly system at the top, if for whatever reason the, you know, the political climate changed where they said, hey, we're not going to send those welfare checks anymore, people's entire livelihood is now dependent on the outcome of, you know, that monopolistic system. Same thing, if people get too dependent on Amazon food delivery services to eat healthy food and then Amazon fails or whatever it is, you know, now that monopoly was what was meeting all the needs. So monopolies are on the other extreme of being really fragile. They could be really efficient and they can, you know, be really effective, but they're really fragile. Why sovereigns, they're really resilient, but they're not effective and they're not efficient. So that's kind of the two extremes. Again, this is unpacking what probably needs an hour but I just wanted to present this because this is how we're approaching designing new economies. Um, and it's helpful to have these concepts in mind. Okay, I'll pause there. Um, and let me know also if this is helpful or if it's, you know, if I'm going too deep and too weird too fast. Nope, no thoughts. All right, then I'm just gonna keep going for a little bit and I'm gonna go super fast because then you guys can just watch it after, but I just wanna present these concepts. Um, each one of our projects of the 13 in each following season, I think they're gonna start landing somewhere on this spectrum. So when people are showing up and they can help you know, find the projects that are most right for them based on however that project's approaching meeting people's needs. So this is the first principles I just came to, like, how do we meet our needs? So when people are showing up to this movement, that's the answer or the question they might be asking themselves that we're trying to answer. Like, we're going to try to meet your needs in a more effective way. Okay, so what technologies, you know, what are our social technologies? What economic and governance systems are we using? And what um, actual technology, whether it's artificial or organic, are we using to meet our needs for housing, for example? So we can have a bunch of examples here. So over on the right, you might have a monopoly based system where the state or the project itself provides all the housing for all members. 
So again, you see this might not be a bad thing. So projects that are saying, hey, we provide housing and it's egalitarian. So it's over here on the monopoly side where the project itself, whether it's a charity or a nonprofit or DAO or whatever it is, is providing and owning all the housing for members, okay? And then maybe it's using really cool advanced technology like 3D printed hempcrete houses. So they, they land up here, you know, pretty advanced on the artificial technology side, um, but also pretty centralized in governance and economic power because the project itself is now dictating, you know, housing and who owns what housing and who's, et cetera. But then we have the free market side, you know, well, okay, well, markets provide housing. We get this weird environment then where people are buying up housing and speculating on it. Anyway, you all know what the markets do and how that's kind of broken housing. Uh, but then, you know, more advanced technology, of course, we can say we need 3D print houses. Uh, but free market housing could be every person in our project can own their house. And they also can sell their house on the market for whatever price they want to sell it at. So now we're using free market dynamics for people to meet their housing needs. Most projects are like that because that's just what our, you know, global economy provides. So that's free market housing. Um, I talked about the problems, but I think we can do better. So then we move into kind of like role-based economies. So that's when we set up a role or a circle rather in our economy for housing. And then you let that circle decide how they're gonna meet the need of housing for all the other members. Maybe they pool money from all the members and then they build houses from there um, or whatever. There's a whole bunch of different ways that the, the members of this circle can figure out how to meet the need for housing. You know, for example, they could even uh, coordinate with the festival circle and coordinate home raising festivals where people in the community are coming together and building earthships and the community itself are building the houses in the community. Because earthships, the major cost of them is labor. So the community is coming together and building the community housing like that's one way of meeting our housing need as a community, right? Um, or you have the sovereign based economies, which is when you give, you know, legal title, whether it's Dow governed legal title or whatever it is. Um, to each family to have their particular, you know, one acre, one hectare, or whatever it is, spot of land. And we give them stewardship ability for that piece of land, and they, in all rights and purposes, own that land, as long as they're being good stewards or whatever, you know, constraints the project might, you know, establish. So then you say, okay, each person then has their own plot of land with their own house attached to it or whatever, and that's where you get more on the sovereign side because now that person has a house in perpetuity as long as you know certain conditions are met or whatever. Um, or maybe without even having that, maybe saying, hey, they have free title of the land um, would probably be more accurate over here. So anyway, we're gonna go through this and say, okay, how do we meet our need for housing? Where do we fit here within our particular project? And then we're gonna do that for each one of the needs. That's a different thing. So how do we meet our need for food, for example? You know, Where do we fit on this spectrum? And then walk through each one of the needs that we identified at the beginning of this that we established and said we were trying to meet this need and then figure out how we're going to actually meet that need. Because then we need a circle and a role responsible for or you know we need a structure whether you're using the market or whatever responsible for meeting these needs, and this is going to help us identify what we're actually structuring here right. Um, you can go to this deck and go over it if you want i'm going to stop here because I feel like i'm going on a lot about this. Um, so yeah, I'll pause and get feedback, thoughts, questions on any of this. And if you feel like this is going the right direction too, because I'm really trying to capture what's emerging here also, uh, and trying to have this reflected back into this deck in this presentation that I'm creating. Um, so right now would be a perfect time to give those reflections on how you feel it's being presented and designed so far, if this makes sense, what's missing, um, any of that. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice presented. Um, I feel there's a lot of in, uh, collective intelligence that has been, as you mentioned, people that actually been focused on analyzing and studies different. So for sure, you could give maybe a couple options of when you have these models, like maybe even more that are more holistic approach or not more holistic, but like trying 
to put it in different words that for certain people might make more sense, as well as the uh, well, one thing that I wanted to share the the eight capital system that could also be used for for the needs for meeting the needs. Uh, we found it very useful when we discovered there was like a parallel relation to the what people can contribute and what my people might be. So well. I could even, if there's time, share a little bit of that exploration. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's probably worth sharing, saying again and again, um, all of these were examples. So using that eight capital framework, I'm not entirely familiar with what exactly that entails, but that might be more free market leaning, where you're using open capitals and there are aligned incentives in order to meet needs. And again, there's a whole vast frontier of territory that can be explored with that. Um, so I'm saying they're just different structures. And um, actually, this one's probably worth diving into. So I'm going to. Yeah. So I want to explain these axes just a little bit more. One is that, you know, no axes that's saying it's a spot in time is ever accurate. So I'm saying these are active things, you know, decentralizing rather than decentralized, you know, advancing rather than advanced. Meaning that when you're putting a technology here, it's not, it, it isn't is something, it's moving us in a particular direction. You know, for example, free markets, they weren't always centralizing. Free markets were one point decentralizing when all we had was kings and empires and feudal states, right? So when we had monopoly only systems, the free market actually came and decentralized it and said, now anyone can be, you know, an oligarch and it opened that up. But now, you know, free markets, they're concentrating because economies of scale, networks, now Amazon and Google of the world, they're concentrating up everything and all the power. Okay, so the free market doesn't necessarily work either. Now that's centralized. Uh, so we can move to <clears throat> Um, I think that some people aren't seeing your screen or anyone right now. Well, it's back. Now we can see it. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Um, you can see it now? Yes. Yeah. I see it, Reiki. All right. Not me. Yeah, satellite internet. Anyway, so to kind of wrap this up, because it can go on forever. Um, role-based economies might also become centralizing at some point too if we're not thoughtful about how we design a role and design roles that have too much power then over time those roles are going to actually be the new centralizing you know authority figures and we kind of like are repeating the revolution pattern so when we're designing our roles we need to be designing out well if, if you're decentralizing if it's of course your goal if your goal isn't to do that then don't worry about this at all uh, but if your goal is to move more on that decentralizing pattern and self-sovereignty, then we want to be really thoughtful with what roles we design that have power and how there's always checks and balances between those roles and the power that they're holding. So one way of setting up checks and balances is to always have, you know, sunset clauses. So this is why Haifa designed it so that every role expires in three months or whatever it is. It's that, you know, power can't sit there and concentrate. People have to continually agree to be subjected to some form of power. So every three months, everyone continues to, you know, give their agreement that, yep, you know, I'm fine with this person having all this power, whatever that power is. So that's one way of doing it is having those terms. The other way of doing it is having, you know, a rotation of power. So you might say that we have this coordinator role that has a lot of power, but every season it flops. You know, there's a different team. You know, there's the winter team and the summer team, you know, in essence, and they kind of flop around and swap each other. You know, one culture did this and it was written about by the uh, the Dawn of Everything book that some of you guys have read, uh, A New History of Humanity. Uh, they talked about some cultures who through summer and winter seasons, they had different political and economic systems that reversed all the roles. So the roles that had all the power in summer were the ones that were taking orders from all the people in winter. And what this kind of ensured is that because of those power dynamics, people are always kind to each other. Because if you abused your power in summer, then you're probably going to get abused in winter. So you don't want to be abused. 
So you made sure that you're a good ruler. At least this was kind of their, their guiding logic of how they created stable economic systems by making sure that power was always moving around. So that's the, you know, the dance, the tightrope dance we're kind of doing between sovereign-based economies and these role-based economies, um, or all the different types of economies that could exist here. Again, these are examples. Um, is the role-based economies help us coordinate more effectively? Us all being alone in our own homesteads, that's not going to solve any of our global crises. You know, us all being alone taking care of our own homesteads, not going to solve the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Like, yeah, it'll prevent it from happening if every 8 billion person, you know, joins and becomes sovereign, but that's not likely. So we still need to collaborate and coordinate and scale our impact. But if we do that too much, then we become too dependent on those systems and then those systems can become tyrannical. So we wanna have the balance that our needs aren't dependent on that system, so that system can never become tyrannical. Because systems can only you know, be tyrannical if they can come between you and your needs becoming met. Um, so anyway, this is you know, where I think we're at with our projects is that dance between, okay, how are everyone sovereign? Like how are their needs being met regardless of how our economies are designed? You know, and if the internet collapses, are all of our needs still going to be met? So, you know, that's something to consider. Uh, but then as we're designing our roles, how do we design them to make sure that they are decentralizing power? And they're decentralizing what it means, you know, they're making everyone more equal over time. I think that would be kind of a goal for each project to set. And actually, in part of our crowdfunding, we do that. Um, if you follow this model, again, this is... This is all up for us to kind of, you know, meddle with and play with. Is in when you come to this crowd pooling concept, you're setting up the idea of egalitarian from the beginning. But of course, for some people, it's going to take time. So let me run through this. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. So this is crowd pooling. Again, watch the presentation that I give to get a little bit more clarity if me just diving is too fast. Um, but this is you from the beginning as a project establishing equality as a, a principle from the beginning. So for actually, you know what? This is probably worth me actually doing properly. So I'm just gonna do it. Bear with me. All right, here's regular crowdfunding we're all familiar with. You come out and you say, hey, we have a project. We want to raise some money. You know, who has money they can give us to help us get our project accomplished? You know, so this person maybe has 150K. This person doesn't have anything, so they can't contribute. And this person can only contribute 10K, et cetera. So you kind of see the disparity of what people have, you know, of liquid cash lying around to contribute to a project. So they were trying to raise 750K, but they were only able to get 555,000, you know, in their crowdfunding efforts. All right, but crowd pooling is a little bit different because we take all the forms of capital. So now we're saying, okay, well, we're not just going to take the money capital you have. We can also pool the other forms of capital that you have. So we were trying to buy 10 hectares of land and raise money for that. But actually, you can give us 10 hectares of land worth 300K. Great. So now we can crowd pool land directly and have the land that we need. You know, um, in this example, we we're raising money to buy homesteading equipment, building equipment, et cetera. This is stuff that we needed for our project to get started, but these people already have that stuff. So now they can contribute. So we thought we needed to raise 750K, but now we only need to raise 650K because 100K worth of equipment was actually contributed by members and people out there, right? Uh, we can go on further and... We also have people setting up their community library. So this is people bringing resources and stuff that they have, materials, that would be great for going in a sharing library. You know, things like all of that stuff that's great to have, you know, once a month, or maybe not even that, that we had it. You know, it still improves our quality of life, but we don't need it all the time. That stuff is all perfect stuff to go into a material library and contribute to the community. So this community looks at those forms of capital as being able to get pooled in their community. So they have, you know, enrich everyone's well-being. You know, a really good example of that is an EV car. You know, so you can have one community car if you're living on a project, and then people can sell those cars and then take the money and pool it in as financial capital too. And now you guys are just sharing an electric car instead of everyone having their own car, right? Yeah, EV cars highlighted. Okay, so we're pooling the other forms of capital. But then we can keep going and we can say now we can have committed capital. 
So this is how we get to making everyone egalitarian over time, is we say, we're going to raise the same amount of money, but some people might have to pool their capital later. So this particular example is everyone was pooling 150 k Now, example A, he, he, that person was able to do all 150 k in cash, great. So they didn't need to contribute any other way. You know, but the second person, they only had 50K cash to contribute in the form of Bitcoin. So how are they going to do their other 100, 100K? Well, they also happen to be a permaculturist. So they're going to commit to contribute $100,000 worth of value to the community over time. And then they're going to earn their tokens that way. So now right from the beginning, as this community is forming, they're saying everyone's going to come in equally, even if not everyone can come in equally. So even so people down here, you know, example J, that person had no money up front to be able to pool, no other forms of capital. They were a refugee, or maybe they were homeless, or you know, all so many people out there who have no upfront capital to their name, right? But they can still come in and say, hey, I'm going to contribute 150K worth of capital over time to become an equal member of this community, right? And then of course, that's where you know tokens come in. Oh, this is the final example, is now from 650 down to 450 because or 540. Ugh. Um, because the other money they were trying to raise was for a natural builder, but then a natural builder actually joined their project, so they didn't need that money. So now this crowd pooling was a success. Now they got 555k out of only the 400, 540 that they need um, in order for this project to kick off and succeed. So this is kind of showing why crowd pooling as a concept could help us, you know, a lot better than crowdfunding ever could. Uh, and then you use tokens to reflect all these contributions. Now you see everyone's coming in at 150 as a minimum. And then as a project, you can say, okay, well, then those 150,000 tokens, that's required to buy this NFT or stake an NFT or whatever it is. And then that gives you access to this project for life. So maybe that gives you your one hectare of land, or maybe that gives you your apartment or house and access to the community spaces or whatever you know membership to your project means. It could be said that you need to contribute this same amount that everyone else is um, in order to be a member. And then when any new member wants to join, it's the exact same process. Are you going to fulfill a role? Are you going to give us some other forms of capital? Are you going to pay up front? Whatever it is, right? You can keep expanding what you need this way. Um, yep. Then the next step, which is then weaving right into the economies we're building. Oops. Let me get back into this. Last thing, I'm sending it over to you, Anders. Um, the next step is then those recurring contributions for our little microeconomies. Uh, if we have them, then we might not have these things at all. So projects, it's gonna vary wildly what this last section over here kind of looks like. Um, but just one example would be, okay, well, we pooled all that value up front that we just went over. So that's how the project was able to get started. You know, that 550, $540,000 of cash they talked about, that was to build all the community housing and everything in order to get people on site and get their basic needs met. But now, like, how do you continue to thrive as a community? Well, then this is where those additional roles are going to show up in quests, is then you as a project can say, well, everyone gives eight hours a week, and we've used eight hours a week, and now we can meet all of our needs if everyone contributes that much or whatever it is. Um, so then those people can either contribute time or they maybe pay. So this person, again, the top person, this person's really rich. You know, they don't want to contribute much other than money. Um, so they're saying, hey, instead of contributing eight hours a week, what if I only contribute three and then I give $100, you know, 20 bucks an hour or whatever. Um, so that could be another way you can break up the different forms of capital, saying there's different ways you can meet these recurring contributions. But then these recurring contributions is, again, what you set up roles and quests for people to do. So this is what we're literally right here now in the process of designing are the roles that are going to make our you know minimal viable economies here. Um, great. Okay, I'll pause there. Um, send it over to Anders. Yo, um, <laughs> what, one thing uh, after you get this presentation all done, I think that to make it more engaging and interactive before it's actually posted, um, you know, publicly we might as proper as projects want to go through and like riff on some of these things with regard to how we are specifically utilizing these things in our own and then whoever is watching the video can kind of like choose their own adventure and be like oh i want to see how heartland is doing this or it's like oh i want to see how lala gardens is doing that i want to see how they are so that we as like 13 projects 
are interacting with this video and the viewer can kind of like see how it actually applies within these models that we're developing. I love that. And I would absolutely love for every project to make a video kind of going over the same thing and how they do it. You know, that's why I'm trying to figure out those, you know, what are the base units um, that all of us can agree on? You know, our base unit is we're trying to meet each other's needs and we're organizing in some capacity to do that. All right, we can all agree on that foundation and there's a million different ways we can riff on that. Um, and then what I would love then is for those videos, because with this presentation, what I have, I'm starting it off with three of our project videos, the presentations you guys have already done. So I open it up that way and show three of the examples of the 13, so three, three, and four, um, and then go over this. So I kind of introduce some of the diversity and then I explain what's going on here. We're you know, creating new economies and I explain that concept, right? Um, so it would make a lot of sense if each one of our projects were kind of relating to this video, but I know that's kind of recursive here because you needed to see this video and understand it before you can make something that relates to it. So um, that's why I'm also kind of releasing this in four is because the second part of it, where I actually share these slides, could be four different ways of doing it. Either me sharing it four different ways or different people sharing you know, that same presentation. Or it could even be different projects going through that same slideshow from their perspective, right? Um, so that's kind of what I'm exploring right now. I'm wanting to do the first one um, to set the stage. But then if anyone else is like, yep, that would be awesome. I would love to present, you know, the second one or third one or fourth one. So there's four that we'll do. Um, that would be awesome. And then it would be great to get like four different perspectives of how this kind of, um, yeah, you get it. What do you think, Anders? Is that riff where you're riffing? Do you want to do yeah, one it's of great. them? Yeah, great. point. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm super down and excited to see that finished finish piece. I think that your, you know, when you do the whole thing, you know, yeah, just us seeing that is going to allow us to, yeah, just work with you, work with us, work with uh, the collective on it, you know. So thank you so much for doing the, the, the groundwork and getting it started. It's amazing. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and what I would love to do together is, one, keep creating this together so that this is like the first video. And then people go down the rabbit holes of each one of our projects. But then also, this is where they step into roles. So this is, again, the first video that gets everyone on the same page. And then they're like, yep, and I love Heartland. So I'm applying for Heartland. And I showed you guys that last week, actually, the, the sign-up process for becoming, um, getting interested in any of the projects. Um, there's one more thing. It'll come back. Walter, you got your hand up. Yeah, I was trying to sort of see how would, this would work practically. Um, you know, we in our community will have some people come in with with money. They'll be we're trying to work out the right way for I call them journeymen people who have skills and a lot to contribute, but not much money. Um, and and say you know we're that five. And your model you were just showing were five years down the road and and uh, uh, some uh, community member has a hundred hours committed or whatever um, has put into the community and then wants to leave. I, I guess if it's tokenized, they would get tokens and 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 sell that equity they have or or our or uh, all the other members committed to say paying that person $10,000, whatever, you know, I'm just making up an amount that they put into the community in, 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 in work or, or even money. How, how, how do you see that, that happening? How, how does that responsibility carry over for the total community? Yeah. Um... So my always disclaimer, there's going to be infinite ways of doing this. Um, one way of doing this, that is just the one example that we're walking through here in the slides, is if that person was contributing anything, you know, time, then they're earning their tokens over time. But this particular project, for example, is saying you need 150,000 tokens to have that NFT, that means membership. 
So if someone never reached that 150K point, they left you know, early in their role, they said they'd work for five years, but they only ended up working for one, then they don't have 150 tokens. So they actually never became a full member. And some projects can decide that that means something different. Some projects could say you need to have contributed that 150K until you're a full member of the organization. And that could mean and provide different rights. Okay, so maybe they're not on the, you know, the legal title of that land yet until you've contributed the 150K up front. And that actually comes from some intentional communities doing this wrong. They let people who didn't contribute all the money up front and make promises that they can contribute later, you know, put their name on the title. And then if the thing failed, which many examples it did, that person got the same amount of money out. So anyway, you're, you're obviously not doing that. But then in your example, they earned 70,000 tokens and they want to leave. Well, somebody else coming in, they need to have 150,000 tokens. So if they're leaving, then they're leaving means there's a space open. So if they're taking up a house, well, now the house is available. If they're taking up an apartment, well, that apartment's available. So now someone else can come in. And that someone else coming in is going to need that 150,000 tokens. Well, now they can acquire 70,000 of those from that person who's leaving, right? Um, so that person coming in might buy them off of them. And this is what the secondary markets are for. Uh, it doesn't have to be that clunky where someone coming in just buys it off of them. Very likely for all our projects, if we're doing our jobs well, we have a healthy secondary market where that person could just sell their 70,000 tokens and then just walk away, right? Um, so that's what we're wanting to get towards. But of course, that requires us to be liquid and that takes some time. But that's ideally the situation is until it's liquid and they can just sell it and walk away, they make an agreement with the new person coming in that they buy off of them or whatever it is, right? Um, so that's one way that we can go about doing this. Uh -huh. And I kind of, I recommend this, especially for all the projects that are talking about doing NFTs. So these are non-fungible tokens are basically the same thing as titles and that you need to have then contributed the whole base amount for whatever that project is. In this case, it's 150,000 tokens. And then that gets the NFT, which means that you're a full established member. You know, some members become full members from the get-go because they give all 150K up front. Some take, you know, 222 weeks before they're a full member. And maybe that means a lot. Maybe it doesn't mean that much. Maybe full membership is just, you know, one slight extra ability that you have. Maybe you can't even vote or participate in governance until you're a full member. Maybe you can fractionally participate in governance. You know, so I'm not saying that full membership has to mean something, and I know this is complicating it, but I just want to, um, you know, state that for the projects that you can have that full membership capability to make sure that everyone did come in the same amount. And that's really powerful with communities because that makes us all in the same standing, that every member who's a member is an equally contributed member, right? Um, and we can still be egalitarian about how we accomplish that. It just might take some people a little bit longer than others. But then I also recommend, final recommendation here, um, for projects to set a sunset for when that needs to happen from their inception. Meaning that they say, you know, seven years after someone shows up or a project starts, everyone needs to be equal. So when someone's coming in with time and saying they're only going to contribute time, you don't drag that out for 30 years or whatever. You know, ideally, it's condensed down into like a four or five or something year window so that you get to that, you know, equal space a little bit sooner. And all of this is just about establishing trust. So all the members that are there, they can trust that all the other members are going to show up equally, you know, that they're not giving way more than others and all that, you know, community conflict that happens from structural problems of people not thinking it's fair. Um, this just helps set that fairness, you know, as a standard from the get-go, um, which I think is going to help us create more egalitarian organizations. Um, again, if that's your goal, if it's not, then maybe the structure doesn't make any sense for you. Um, did that help answer your question at all, Walter? Um, does anyone else have any thoughts, reflections, anything that they would like to add to this or any other, you know, divergent viewpoints? So I've shared some opinions here. If you have other opinions or feel like any of these opinions are wrong, this is also a space to kind of, you know, give a different perspective. Robert. Yeah, I just want to reflect a bit. Thanks a lot. Um, 
really great stuff you're presenting again. So how do you keep energized, Reiki? <laughs> I'm wondering. But anyhow, uh, I just wanted, to, uh, I'm very much interested in this micro economy, these two slides that you presented and how it actually works and and is sort of suggested to you know explain this in practical how that, does it work in practical terms uh, at all the villages so um my intuition tells me to go a little bit deeper on this maybe if possible with some people who have an interest because i think this is a fascinating part of the transition process that we're in uh, at the end, booting out the fiat system. But uh, anyway, this is a great stepping stone. So that's that's my reflection. Well, and yes. So the new structures we're creating here with each one of our projects, it's kind of like the new company. And you know, the first thing companies produce today, it's a minimal viable product. The first thing I think any one of our projects are going to create today is the minimal viable regenerative economy that we're creating. So I think it is a really, you know, let me bring up the slide. Yeah. I think this is, you know, deeply fast yeah, I, I, place to it's kick coming. it off. Yeah. Oh, are the slides still super slow? Yeah. Anyway, it'll catch up to you. Um, but anyway, I could just keep sharing it that that is what we're producing as each one of the 13 projects and more. And this alliance is a diversity of games is what we can call them so just like you can open up a closet and there's 30 different games that you can play with you and your friends. You know, we can have that same type of environment in our new civilization here they open it up there's like hey these are 30 different projects playing a different minimum viable economy game. And then we can take these games and new projects that are getting started it's like yeah we're just going to copy that game we love it and we're going to change it in these different ways and make it our you know own. So that's kind of why I'm being not helpful in this first season by, you know, not trying to be too prescriptive with what I think. Um, plus, I don't even really think, I don't think there's a best way to do this. I think the best way is having a diversity of approaches. Um, and that's kind of what we're building here. So that's what I really love our output to be is literally, you know, 13 different games at the end of this season that we've created. And the game is very simple. It's a subject for people to be able to show up and be like these are the roles or this is how the economy works this is how you move around the board but in our case moving around the board is living your life you know how do you show up to the project meet your needs and how is life more better and how are we thriving more in this game than in all the games we're leaving behind right um so that's kind of the vision video that we all created while i was trying to talk about like 2030 is we really like this is the new game this is how we meet our needs this is what life looks like you know, and then here's the game box that tells you exactly how we're going to go about making this happen. Um, I know it's complex and we have to hold a lot in order for this to work, but this is the latest of where I think a lot of us are at thinking, okay, in order for this to work, we actually have to kind of take the hole and kind of restart it. Um, the other thing that Robert, you just brought this up that I'm really excited about is setting up the incubators for this. So I think also a lot of our first 13 projects are going to be incubators themselves. So as we go through this really complex process of figuring out how to launch this game that we're creating, that becomes our service to the world. Because a lot of people need to transition. And if we have 13 different university centers that are helping people do that, that's not enough. We need more. So if every one of our projects was being an incubator, that's you know still not enough. <laughs> But then our incubator is helping groups of people literally like let's say we bring 144 people together and then they go through the process of setting up their game and just real simple how this could look outside of what i presented here and this i think is a really powerful piece for each one of us to consider is let's imagine that you know we shared this video we have thousands of people who want to join a community we're like, great, then our role is to then bunch them into cohorts and then send them to one of our projects to go through an incubator process. And a general overview that I'm just sharing with you all here, because again, this is gonna be very diverse. Each one of our projects is gonna have a different way of offering this. But if we take a lot of wisdom from rites of passage and a whole lot of ancient technologies, you know, one way looks like this, you show up, the first step is to you know, dissolve your current identity. So this is kind of what a rite of passage is all about. The first step is something difficult, something challenging. 
that helps you shed who you are and reevaluate who you are so that you can reconsider how you want to show up in the next stage of your life, you know, or in this project, etc. So I think something like that needs to exist in each one of the projects. Um, for example, it could be we're going to do a 14 day fast with 10 days of silence or the other way around 14 days of silence, 10 days of fasting, you know, mixed in with some of these like grueling tasks. That means you have to like really be, you know, physically and spiritually prepared for this. This isn't something simple and it's going to be something difficult that builds community and builds cohesion. This is, again, a, a principle in community building is to go through tension and struggle together now, life can create that circumstance with a, you know, a disaster or a war or something, or we can be an intelligent human species and we can artificially create it ourselves by the rights that we design for joining our project. So we make it intentionally difficult to join so that one, people are more committed, and two, you know, it creates more cohesion as a community by having endured whatever that was. Now, a really powerful right is one that's going to, you know, and benefit the person. So where fraternities have taken this and made it wrong is they say, we're going to make it difficult by torturing you and punishing you. Okay, they're half right, but I don't think they were quite there. You know, the challenge needs to be something that's deeply nourishing for people. So for example, fasting from food and from talking, it's very difficult, but it's incredibly nourishing. You know, achieving that is going to be really good for you. It's not like getting whipped and beaten at a fraternity or something, right? So anyway, I bring that up because it's kind of the first meta step for becoming a member of our organizations is having that membrane. And if we really intelligently design what that membrane looks like, we're going to ensure that the people who are being part of our project really want to be there. They have the certain skills and whatever we're looking for. Um, so that's what we kind of want to bake into that right. And now you see why it's really important for there to be a circle that's based just on rights, because rights could be a really powerful way of scaling community building. And helping you know design our new societies here are the rights that we're designing for example again fasting from food and from speaking and everything is a right um so anyway that first step is kind of dissolving your identity the second step is discovering that new identity so we talked about ikigai roles that could be part of it it's like what is your ikigai what is your purpose how do you really want to show up in the world what's going to bring the most value to you in the community etc you know, what does that really mean? So then having a space for people to deeply consider that, you know, after they've gone through a process of intentionally shedding their previous identity, because then that helps them more fully show up into step three, which is when the community comes together to design their new economy. So ideally it could look like this, someone shows up with all their thoughts of who they think they are and how they're gonna show up. They go through step one, completely shatters that, they find out much deeper truth about themselves and how they wanna show up. You know, they help unpack what that role actually looks like. So then when the community comes together and say, hey, this is our economy, these are all the different roles that we have. Someone's like, yep, that's my passion. That's my purpose. That's the new self I want to embody now. You know, I'm going to fill that role in this new community. And what I think would be exceptionally powerful is that the no talking part is the first part and the community hasn't met them each other yet. So you can even have like exercises where people come together and they're not talking, but they're seeing each other. But anyway, point is, is that it gives you time to really figure out who you want to be in this next stage that we're stepping into, rather than just bringing old patterns and whatever with you that don't serve you. So that's also why that first step is really important to shed some of those old patterns so that by the time you get to step three, we're not just rebuilding exactly what we already have. You know, that's not going to serve us. Step three really can be transformative if we make sure we have that space for people to go through that personal transformation that they need um, to fully show up in this new community. So that's how I can see people actually joining our projects and kind of being baked into our, you know, our festivals and setting these things up. Um, but we don't need to do that necessarily to design what roles and circles and everything we need in our organization first. So that could be it, is that we already have that template so that when we have 150 people show up to our project, they go through that process, when you get to step three, when you're designing your economy, that's when we show the templates and the stuff that we've worked on right now and be like, great, so this is the economy we've been thinking about. These are the roles that we might have available and then we can build off of that. Um, or maybe you don't wanna do that at all and you wanna wait until you have your community do that. I think it could get a little bit more messy that way. Um, so I'm just encouraging us to have 
you know, the bones of what this new economy looks like established first. And then in step three is when you actually go through and, you know, build the organs and the tissue and you really define the details of the economy as people show up. Um, and this is also kind of then last piece. This is what ensures that each one of these economies is going to be, you know, diverse and representative of the people who are part of it. Is that step three, after the people have gone through, they've you know, shed their old identity, they've identified a new identity of who they really want to be, you know, and then they take that when they design their economy together. That's going to require that each economy is diverse because all the humans that make up the co-creation of that economy is going to be diverse. So the pattern is what we're unpacking here. And then, of course, we're going to have a bunch of different games because we went through the shared process. Um, Anders, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to reflect on this particular slide, I think could be a really, really good one for each of our projects to do a little screen share about and share like where we are with each one of these steps. And at some point, maybe it would be good for us to uh, like, to say that there has to be a certain, um, like all of our projects have to be a certain, like along this process um, to a certain degree in order to be part of this process. So that, so that we can all explain that like where we are in all these different steps. I'm not sure exactly what that'll look like, but I really like this slide. And I think that this could be a good one and really interesting for us to learn about each other's communities and for others to learn about us. I think that would be hugely valuable to add to our library. Um, so on top of your introduction, then having a as short as you can make it, ideally, kind of overview of each one of these things. Yeah, hugely valuable. And if you gave that to me, then I'll just add it up to the knowledge base right now, because uh, people are already going there to learn about your project and starting to apply. Um, so we're already getting people who are applying to join our mailing list and all that stuff. Um, I think I'll wait until we have a little bit more of a critical mass and we've shared this more before sending it to you guys. But anyway, yes, make those videos, send them to me and I'll add them up there. I think that's an incredible idea. Um, anything else? Uh, we have a short amount of a smaller amount of people on the call today, and we have six more minutes in our time. So maybe we can just go around in the circle and everyone can reflect real quickly because I'd like to hear from some people who haven't spoken very much. Um, and then we could just pass it and do a closeout. Um, what do you all think of that? Yep, I'm a facilitator. So take long. Um, how about Nadine? I'll pass it to you and then you just pass it. Oh, thank you, Reggie. Thank you so much from my deepest heart. Thank you for all the wisdom that you're sharing that yeah, is you are blessed and we are blessed with your presence. Thank you so much. And um, I'm supporting Tabire and Aratibu, where many of the shareholders are very eager every time to to listen and what is coming through you and then I can share to them. Of course, it's a lot of information and not everyone is uh, receptive for all this amazing amazing information that you are sharing that means they are receptive but they're, they're not ready yet um, because you need a very big universe in your mind to to make sense of all of that so i'm very very happy to yeah to share this with others so thank you so much from my deepest heart i'm looking forward to visit other projects on my travel I'm looking forward to see walter soon and yeah Thank you so much. Passing to Walter. Uh, well, Reiki, you're sometimes a little radical. <laughs> uh, I, I had a model in in uh, for Finca Sagrada. You know, we have four uh, really great partners here, but they're all paid, and and they're happy with that. You know, they can send their kids to college and all that kind of stuff. And I hadn't really thought of them as um, coming in over, say, a five-year period, being equal members. We had the LLC or SAS, and, and also we have a not-for-profit association, and the decision-making would be within the association. But uh, what you were presenting was a very different model, so I'm you know, thinking about that. Uh, if 
how how to make that those ideas appropriate for what we're doing and if people even want it and anyway lots of stuff to think about so thanks oh i, I want to um, i want to riff back on that because thank you um <clears throat> i think it's it's always about paying people what they're worth so i think that's the the ethic that I'm trying to bring to this is to say, let's pay people what they're actually worth. So that's my bias here. Um, if you already are doing that up front with cash, I don't think there's a problem. They're happy with the relationship. They're getting paid what they're worth. Everything is fine. If it is like you're not paying them fully what they're worth, but what they'll take, then maybe you can do the difference in equity. And then maybe, yeah, over time, they're earning a share. It might take them you know, 30 years. What I shared with you is a fully token-based model and the models that I was presenting. The only difference would be that, you know, say that yoga teacher was getting paid half in cash because they needed to, then instead of it taking them 200 weeks in order to be an equal partner, it might take them 400 weeks if half of their, you know, contribution was getting paid up front in cash. Um, so you can make the different ways of paying people if people are needing cash. What I shared was a really simplified model that if all we have is tokens, this is how we distribute tokens to make it equal. But again, if you're paying people in cash, just for every dollar you pay them, send them one less token, right? Um, so I want to say it's inclusive of what you're doing. And yeah, thank you for that reflection. And whoever you wanted to pass it back to, I'll give it back to you. Uh, Anders. Hey, uh, don't have too much else to add to here. Just excited about um, excited about this coming together and you know, the next stages that we get to add, the next layers that we get to add on this as a collective. So uh, good job and excited for us right now. I don't, let's see here. Um, let's go to Felipe. Thank you very much, family. We're just very glad to hear all these conversations and we are very interested and focused on creating these programs for within different communities and different projects so happy to or enthusiastic about continue this co-creation very much i pass it to uh, stephen hi there um yeah, I've uh, had intermittent internet issues today and uh, a little bit of ambient noise, so I haven't chimed in much, but I've been uh, enjoying the conversation, picking up some good bits. Um, thanks, Reiki, for sharing that document and putting that together. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited to carry on the journey. Um, no major comments on what was spoken on today. Will, do you have anything? Hey, guys. No, I'm all good. I just had a swim in the lake and feeling fresh. I'm very happy that you guys are doing this and Happy to plug in and unplug and plug back in and yeah, keep going, guys. I think it's just Robert. You want? Oh, and Roberto. Yeah. So whichever Thanks. one you want. Yeah. yeah. Well, Maybe Robert. Yeah. Robert yeah. Robert. I'll go. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. No, I think it was uh, very, uh, as I said, uh, fascinating meeting and great presentation um like i said particularly interested in the microeconomy and the eight forms of capital how does does it work in practice and also particularly interested in learning more about this identity steps with sort of dissolving the identity and um finding a new one i think i want to learn more about the processes that you have in mind on that uh, I'm also connected to some teams that are also doing some research on that part. So it might be interesting to sort of make a connection. So, but thanks a lot. And I'll pass it on to Roberto and Laura. Thank you, Robert. And yeah, thanks directly for the presentation. It's, uh, yeah, I really like the idea of the Hungalitarian uh, contribution, let's say. Um, yeah, I was actually wondering what would happen afterwards, after the contributions are or equalized, basically, uh, from that point on, how do we move forward with, with the project? But I really like the fact that uh, it's very simple to explain to others, and I think it's very replicable. So it's, it's a very good starting point. And then 
think everybody will go in its own direction, I guess, after we reach that kind of egalitarian point. Pass it back to you. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's center. actually by design that it is just to get us to that egalitarian point. Because then from that plane, and it's the same way with designing new economies. Once we get to that sovereign economy, where all of our needs are met without having an economy, we get to design radically new things that we didn't think were available to us before. Because if all of our needs are met outside of the economic system, then what we're coordinating to do is really just about our wants. You know, so maybe we want to, you know, be multiplanetary and then we go about, you know, figuring out how to do that or whatever it is. But we're not doing it from a place of like fear, scarcity, you know, coercion, et cetera. So that once we go to the other side of that scale, it becomes something new. And that new thing is going to be completely unique for every group of humans that come together to create that new thing. So it would be impossible to actually say what it is going to be after these steps are followed, because the result is going to be radically different for every group that goes through it, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it's right with what you're saying that, you know, we're trying to figure out that process to go through where going through the process creates that diversity that's unique for every group that goes through it. Um, and that's what I think true, you know, regeneration and resiliency is kind of really about is helping unpack that, you know, unique economy that wants to exist there. It's kind of the same thing with, you know, permaculture. You can never sit there and like map out the best permaculture garden or whatever it is. You have to go to the land. You have to observe, you know. <laughs> You go through the process of figuring out what the land wants to become and then you help it become it we're doing the same thing with our communities and economies here we're going through the process of we're going through the process of creating an economic system that helps us meet our needs so again very basic stuff how are we coming together to coordinate to meet all our needs let's identify those needs and the structure that emerges through that process is going to be unique for every community um, and maybe radically unique, you know, some communities, maybe they're like, a, you know, a, a subsection of Boeing and they're making airplanes and part of their process is making airplanes and selling them and that's giving them money to buy food. You know, they can go through this literal regenerative framework and be an airplane making company, you know, buying food. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's a similar framework that can have radically different results, which is why that first step of what Robert talked about, which is kind of that personal transformation is so important. Because this process could be used to, you know, hyperextend capitalism and exploit our world, or be used to regenerate our planet and help us become multiplanetary. Like, you know, there's this could be in any, you know, any side of that, because it fully depends on the people who are showing up to, you know, embody and become that economy. So I think it's you know, mandatory almost that when we're thinking about bringing people together to create this, if we have a really clear, you know, onboarding membership structure. Not only are we going to save ourselves a decade of conflict, you know, we're going to radically increase our chances of success and we're going to build, you know, much deeper authentic community, which a lot of us are hoping to do. Um, so it's, it, it had to be a change that I had to go through because once upon a time I thought, you know, radical openness was the way to go, that having strong boundaries was too exclusive and blah, 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 and all the things that I kind of believed. But then again, I kind of had the understanding that, wait a second, you know, stomach acid in the lungs isn't a good thing. So radical inclusion doesn't actually create a healthy organism. We actually need strong boundaries, but what we need is a diversity. Then. So we're not saying, you know, we only have one regenerative economy and here's the, you know, very strict process to join. We say we have 10,000 and every single one of them has a really strict process, but one of those strict processes is going to be exactly what you want to be part of. And it's going to fulfill your need. Because as people who are thinking about joining these communities, they're going to think, you know, who are these other people? Like, you know, I want my kids to be around people I trust and that I have a lot of respect for, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so how do I know that the people who are going to be part of this project that I'm joining are going to be at that same level? Well, again, the onboarding process is how people, how, how you know that those are the right people um, and how everyone else knows that they're going to be the right people as well. So putting that time into that onboarding process is, you know, the analogy about sharpening the, the axe. That's a terrible one because I hate cutting down trees. The analogy of sharpening the spade, you know, let's make sure that our tools that we're going through are really well prepared because then it's going to save us tons of time. You guys get that one? Um, 
so yeah, I really just wanted to elaborate and go over time here today to express that because I think it, I know it's more time and I feel like I keep getting this sense that it feels like we're going too long on this. But I just want to keep reminding and sharing that I've personally chosen to take the path that is going to be a little bit longer for us, um, but more effective, hopefully. So that's kind of why I've slowed down with the incubator, doing a little bit deeper thinking, kind of making sure that we're actually addressing our problems, because I think that nervousness, it kind of comes from market forces and capitalism where, you know, you've got to keep going and, you know, hitting high results and et cetera. That causes us to burn out, you know, have poor decision making and poor sense making and all that, you know, terrible stuff that results in our collapse of civilization. So I'm sharing all of this because I know we're going deeper, um, which is a little bit against what's been expressed, but I think it's just the right way to keep going from here. So maybe we just reevaluate our timelines of when we're actually gonna be announcing what we're doing to the world. But when we announce it, I want it to be complete. So that when we're coming out to the world, we're saying, hey, you know, you can join a regenerative renaissance. We actually have the whole process for them to be like, holy shit, this was the coolest video I've ever seen to them actually being on the ground, contributing in a community. And if we have any gap along the way, we're going to have a lot of tension because if we're really successful at that first video where, you know, a million people show up, but we can't take any of them, what did that actually do for us? Um, maybe it harmed our vision and then a whole bunch of people got, you know, dispirited because they got excited, you know, they sold their house, they got all ready, and then we are not able to take them and we're not able to actually, you know, fulfill our promise or whatever. Like that's so, you know, really deeply embodying that understanding that I'm like, all right, let's take our time. Let's make sure the process is fully fleshed out. If we can, um, if anyone's like really stressed for money, like let us know. There's been some people that have offered to come in with investment and have just said like, hey, it's not actually going to serve us right now um, because like, how are we going to deploy it? You know, what's our governance strategy, et cetera. But if people are like desperate for that, then I have a reason for us to actually accept that and do something with it. Um, so I say that to say that I'm wanting to extend this process, make sure we're being really thoughtful and articulate as we're moving through it. So that when we announce what we're doing to the world, we can actually fulfill the, you know, the promises we're making here. Um, so that's kind of my closing remarks. Um, I love all of the feedback that you've been giving. I think that we definitely have the wisdom and all the tools we need within our alliance already to achieve this. I think we're just kind of at that last step of weaving it all together, creating a coherent path of what it actually looks like, articulating that coherent path, and then pressing play ourselves. Um, so to leave us all with the last bit of context, I have, you know, imagine that happening on the December solstice now. So that's when we actually launch Region Civics. We have the roles ourselves, and we're ready to kind of announce what we're doing uh, to the world. I kind of see that happening later this year. Um, so I'm setting that anchor point to kind of know that let's go slower, more, you know, complete, um, rather than trying to rush to some point. <laughs> Plus it helps me out because I have a baby and that serves my needs. Okay. All right. So I spoke a lot. Hopefully awesome. that was helpful. Thank <laughs> Love you all. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mikey. Thanks, guys, everyone, for being here. Much love. Be Enjoy. well. Um, Anders, you have your hand up. But if anyone wants to leave, feel free to take it off now. Uh, you're still muted. No. Yeah. Five minutes. I was just saying, do you still have time to stay on for a little bit, for a couple minutes, or no? No. No. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. 